Thank you again for joining, Daniel. I'd love for you to introduce yourself and share about big e-commerce through. Yeah, I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon, Dan Fertig. Uh, I'm with a company called Big Commerce. We're a, a US-based software company that enables brands to sell online. We serve about 60,000 customers globally, selling into close to 130 different countries. Um, probably the one thing I would leave you with to think about for the company is it's a really strong combination of usability and flexibility. So we have customers that are just getting started selling online, all the way up to Siemens Healthcare, who uses big commerce to sell $50,000 ultrasound equipment in eight countries. Um, so really flexible piece of software. My role specifically is I work with our great delivery partners, partners like Trellis, who are building out beautiful, high-performing, high-converting websites on our software. Um, and our, our lending expertise around everything from user experience to international expansion to, you know, what are the right back office systems to be using for your business as well. Great. And before we dive into your customer success stories, I'd love to a little bit understand um, the client base between e-commerce. Sure. How much of it is international versus U.S. based? Yeah, it's actually really interesting. I, I would say the majority of our customers uh, are actually U.S. based but they behave differently. Um, if you are a European merchant or you are a merchant based in Australia, New Zealand or other parts of Asia Pacific, selling internationally is a really standard way to do business, right? If you're based in the UK, for example, it's kind of a natural extension, Brexit notwithstanding, to you know, plan to extend your offering to a whole variety of you know, countries in mainland Europe. Same with Southeast Asia, for example. Um, in the US, up until just a, a couple of years ago, really, that the domain of expanding internationally was really left to big box retailers, really large brands with massive teams. It's only over the last, I'd say, 36 months where you're starting to see small business and mid-market type customers you know, be enabled and empowered um, not just through our software, but you know many of the folks that you've heard from today during the sessions to be able to sell internationally as well. So thank you for, so much for sharing that. So to kind of dive in now, what are the key areas that merchants need to focus or consider once they made the decision to go international? Um, what should be a key part of their plan? Yeah, and um, it's an important question. I thought about when we were going to do this session, uh, doing a screen share. I, I, I won't necessarily do a screen share here. I'll walk through, you know, really the five core foundational considerations when you're thinking about going international and what that entails. Um, do you have, you know, slides behind this? If people want to reach out to me or discuss in the networking session, happy to package this up, put it in a PDF, get it out um, through Trellis as well. Um, really quickly, Great. just, you know, in the interest of time, you know, the, the five key areas that I always recommend our customers think about are the following. And then I'll dive into just a moment on, on each of them. So I apologize ahead of time. This will be a little bit long winded, this answer. Um, the first is, it sounds obvious, um, but it's really about identifying the markets into which you're looking to expand, right? And so that's oftentimes not an easy question to answer because you could just theoretically through our, through our software and many other brands, just you know turn it on for multiple countries, honestly, wherever your, your payment gateway enables you to take a payment. But there's a lot more to it than that. And I typically recommend to merchants for the majority of the merchants I speak to that they be quite strategic about where they want to invest, right? Where is your product a really good fit for the market? Um, what countries have strong e-commerce adoption? Who are your competitors in those countries and what are they doing well? What are they not doing well? Are they growing quickly and is there unmet demand? What does your web data tell you, right? If you are looking at your web data and you're seeing a ton of traffic coming from a particular country, you know, pretty good indicator typically that that might be you know, a, a place for you to be focused. Um, so do your homework on product fit, market fit, internet readiness, right? Justin on the previous session said not everywhere has great access to internet. You need to be thinking about those things if you are digital only. Um, and then one thing that is oftentimes overlooked when you're thinking about the market is, you know, are you staffed to do it appropriately, um, right? How are you going to manage your international markets? We'll get into the product side of things, but you know, 
do you have domain knowledge um, locally in your team that you can actually have on the ground? How are you going to be thinking about you know, managing those sites um, versus your core.com? So you really want to be thinking about how you're going to staff uh, the international expansion. It doesn't have to be over-invested or over-leveraged, but it is certainly worth thinking about. And oftentimes, people go through this exercise without actually thinking about, do I have the team size to start to think through acquisition and conversion funnel and product mix and pricing for each of these markets? The second is about you know, channel prioritization, right? And so you know, different people shop differently in, in different countries. Um, there are different avenues to acquire customers as well, right? Um, so Facebook at this point is fairly universal, but if you're thinking about international expansion through China, for example, you're going to need to familiarize yourself with Baidu just as much as you are Google, right? Um, are, how is your mobile experience? And, and, and it might not necessarily just be enough to be mobile optimized, but for example, if South Africa is a really important market for you because you see a major product fit, you see a lot of organic traffic from South Africa, you really need to be thinking about how you're going to serve those customers because shopping in South Africa actually takes place more often on native apps, right? And so if you don't have a native app, you need to be thinking either about a progressive web app or you need to be thinking about building a native app um, for your store presence. Um, different social media platforms behave differently. Um, and there are different marketplaces, right? Selling on you know, eBay uh, motors in the UK is a different consideration than, the, than doing that in, in the US, for example. Are you set up to be able to do that if you sell automotives uh, and cars and aftermarket parts and you want to sell in the UK, for example? Um, also worth, worth thinking through not just the search acquisition strategy, but um, you know, a potential influencer strategy, meaning if you're going to lead into a new market, you may want to, especially if your product suits that type of customer, Right. If you sell heavy machinery, maybe a social influencer might not be the right approach. But if you sell certain products that are you know, inclined towards that target audience, um, you might want to be thinking about what's my influencer strategy in a local market. Can I seed product to those influencers? Can I pay them to create a video, whether that's on YouTube, whether that's on Instagram, whether that's on you know, TikTok or any other social channel? So you know, we start talking about identifying those top markets and then prioritizing the channels through which you're going to go acquire and convert uh, customers. Talk about converting customers, you need to be able to accept payments, right? Um, I'll get into logistics in a second, and there are many experts uh, on this call that you heard from before, um, but on the payment side specifically, you need to be thinking not just about the right gateway, if you're thinking about brick and mortar, the right point of sale solution, but you also need to be thinking about the right payment methods, whereas in most of the developed US and Europe, you know, credit cards are, are, you know, the default currency for online transactions. In much of Asia, it's cash on delivery, right? And so you need to be thinking about any market you're going to extend into, um, how you're actually going to uh, serve local customers in the way that they want to be served. You also do need to be thinking about fraud. You're exposed to a greater level of fraud when you sell internationally. Um, and so you do need to be thinking about how am I managing fraud? How am I managing um, potential fraudulent returns, potential fraudulent um, transactions? And you do need to be thinking through it that way as well. Um, so that's really the payment side. And honestly, that could be an entire 30 to a minute to an hour long conversation. In oh, for sure. um, so I'm going real fast here. I hope that's okay in the interest of time. Um, but oh, these no, are all good. Yeah, they're you're furiously taking notes right now, I'm okay. sure. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say this was a long answer to a, a fairly simple question. Uh, just two more that I'll touch on, and then we can talk about the stories. Um, so logistics, right? We heard from several experts, Zonos and others, around logistics, right? You really do need to be thinking about how you're going to be handling returns, what's so your return policy. Are you going to be drop shipping? Are you going to be doing third-party logistics? Are you going to be doing... Fulfillment by Amazon, you do need to really think through what your fulfillment and what your return strategy is. You also need to be thinking about, you know, taxes and duties, um, you know, and, you know, most good platforms should have a lot of that stuff either baked in or integrated with great software partners. Um, 
but you, it is something that you need to consider, right? Your fully landed cost for shipping and sending out products and what that ultimately means for the customer as well, right? We have the US as a free trade agreement with 20 countries, right? Is, is the country that you wanna sell into part of that? If not, you know, there are real meaningful duty considerations that you're gonna have as a brand that you need to think through. Um, and then when you're taking those transactions, you wanna be making sure you're presenting it in the right currency, you're transacting in the right currency that doesn't incur a cost to you or to the, to the customer. And then obviously settling that transaction in the currency that's most conducive to you so you don't have to pay you know, additional fees on that as well. So that's, that's logistics, a really important but oftentimes overlooked consideration. And I'm glad some of the product, some of the logistics experts were able to share their thoughts today. I thought it was an awesome session. Um, the last and, um, you know, this is in some ways the most challenging um, and honestly, it's probably the one where I would lead on, lean on an agency to a large degree who has local domain experience. And that is the nebulous term of a localized customer experience, right? And customer experience can mean a lot of things. It can obviously mean customer support, right? If all of a sudden you're selling in, in Asia, do you need time zone that's Asia friendly? Do you have chat set up and, and ability to handle those types of conversations? if you don't want to staff for it. Um, you need to be thinking about your merchandising strategy locally as well, right? And not just um, you know, language translation, which is a critical part of how you want to think about it, but it needs to be smart, right? Pan pants or trousers, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a one-to-one -one type of translation. Um, you need to be thinking about your product, miss um, product mix in each country as well, right? If you sell winter coats, um, and you're trying to sell that into Dubai, you need to be thinking about seasonality or, or if it's a fit at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, pricing, is pricing going to be the same in each country? Um, I mentioned, you know, seasonality already. Imagery is really important, and there's nuance to the type of imagery that is most, um, I would say, friendly to different populations. You might want to think about different types of photography for different markets as well, different models, different looks, different feels, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so you need to be thinking about, do you have the right product imagery and the right models to serve that local market? Um, or do you risk offending that local market? And then you need to be thinking about things as granular as address format. Are you able to take an address format format that is a fit for a London, just as much as it's a fit for Sydney, just as much as a, it's a fit for Austin, Texas, right? And so those are all really important considerations when you think about that localized customer experience. There's a longer list than that, um, but in the interest of us only having about 25 minutes, you know, those are some of the things that you definitely want to be thinking about as, as a merchant uh, looking to expand. I, I'm making it sound challenging. It's not meant to make it sound challenging. In fact, if you have the right technology partners and the right um, solutions partners, a lot of this stuff should be fairly out of the box. What's really important for you to think about is identifying where you would make, where your product make most, makes most sense. So that first one, identifying the top markets, is oftentimes the most challenging, and oftentimes that falls more squarely on the merchant than anyone else. Definitely, I mean, it's where you start the ground zero. So, I mean, if you can start that foundation and build it really well and make it strong, then the next steps of bringing in yep. different services and teams to be able to help you expand from there from what you have, then it's a lot more seamless. And I think a huge takeaway from this whole event is that there's so much information, there's so much to do to strengthen your company's move, or if you've already gone international ways to mm -hmm. fine tune it, is that it's okay to not know it all. That's why, you know, people like you and other people who shared are, are experts in specific facets of the field. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, do you want to, you know, do you have team already in house or does it make sense to hire in house yeah. or does it make sense to work with different consulting agencies and teams? So that way you can just achieve those success stories. Yeah. So um, I think with all the information, people would love to hear some examples. So that way they can just see the light at the end of the tunnel, though, you know, what all this work and effort can put into. So I would love to, um, you know, what is um, one of the strategies that you've seen work? I'd yeah. love to hear an example. Yeah, I'll actually steal from the session before me a little bit. Um, you know, Amy 
um, when talking about you know, expanding your partner program uh, internationally, she, she used the phrase test and learn quite a few times. Uh, again, I'm a proponent of not boiling the ocean. And by the way, I have to think about these things too, right? When I think about big commerce expansion, I think about things like product fit, market readiness, and those types of things too. So even on the B2B side, we sell to other companies. Um, these are considerations as well. A, a really strong example, um, and we have case studies on our site for them, uh, of a company that I've seen do it really, really well is Lark. Um, so they're a company that has exploded in the current environment. It's a, it's a product that, it's a, essentially water bottles that are self-cleaning. Um, and so obviously, you know, the amount of plastic use is an issue. So they have not just water bottles, but they've actually taken to making those smart or smarter water bottles that are self-cleaning. And so um, their international expansion plans, I think they're in five different countries now, um, they have been wildly successful, really doing their diligence around which of those markets they want to expand into, and then listening to their customers in each, in each of those markets. So interestingly, what they found is that, you know, in North America, this might not surprise you or anybody else on this call, in North America, we are prone to impulse buy, right? Mm -hmm. We're scrolling Instagram at 1030 at night in bed before we go lights out. I can't tell you how many purchases I or people I know have made after 10 p.m. in bed off of social media, right? That is a U.S. phenomenon that is now just starting in other countries. But Lark, for example, found that, you know, when they expanded into Spain and other parts of Europe, they found that it is less about impulse purchases and a lot more about diligence, product diligence, right? And so on their Spanish site, it's about guiding you through how their products compare to whether it's competing products or traditional, you know, water bottles. We don't need to name brand names, but most people drink from them, um, right? It's an entire plan around once you've decided on the Lark product, which is the right product for you. It's a guided educational purchase on the European site, and that's different from the U.S. site. In the U.S., it's all about, you know, Instagram ad spend, you know, shoppable products, getting people to make impulse purchases. Like, yeah, I should be drinking less water from water, you know, disposable water bottles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they're thinking about, you know, in unique ways, what that user experience should look like. They're also testing and learning in different markets that people use different payment methods, right? So when you think about why people abandon shopping carts, traditionally, the biggest levers are oftentimes shipping costs um, and available payment gateways. Um, so those are those are typically the two biggest drivers of card abandonment, right? Either they don't have a digital wallet at all, and again, it's ten thirty at night. I'm in I'm in bed and I'm not going downstairs to get my wallet, um, mm -hmm. right? Or they don't have the one that I have a wallet in, and so they did a really good job of identifying what are the digital wallets that are predominant in each country. So you know, like Google Pay for them is is killing it in Europe, um, but it's less utilized here in the U.S. Right, and actually, I think even Justin on the previous conversation said, you know, iOS is predominant here, not as much in the rest of the world. So you need to be mindful of these things when you're thinking about what the right user experience is for your customers. For sure, and um, I love how you talked about like you know taking advantage of the impulse buy because you know it's another trend that's that's different that to hear that seems normal to um, you know myself and other Americans because yeah. it's just. With things just being so easy and um, you know it's been touched on other sessions but you know we're really spoiled with how easy and accessible things are especially since a lot of the companies that we buy from are based yeah. in our country so things are just easier and closer and quicker to get what we want and then then you come up to these things when you enter shops where they might have multiple based companies like you know I think a good well used one that a lot of people are used to in the U.S. of understanding a little bit from the international buyer's expected perspective is, for example, Etsy. There's, you know, yeah. there's a wealth of, you know, providers on there from different parts of the world. And you don't really think about it until you see how long shipping takes and, you know, what the actual costs are that's absorbed mm -hmm. by the retailer if you're absorbing and things like that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, things like that's just constantly reminding us of what the other side is, especially since the majority of people attending this conference are U.S. based. So I think the yeah. um, big takeaway is just keep putting yourself in the buyer's shoes, especially when you're going international. Yeah, it's a great point.
I love to hear. Um, so you discussed on Lark. I love to hear about um, what are some of the most overlooked components when selling internationally. You touched on different little pieces there, like you know, mobile accessibility and you know, different buying trends. But I love to hear even more about things. Yeah. That we <laughs> yeah, and, and Lark's a, an example of one where I mean they're digitally native. So in many ways, if you're purely digitally native meaning you're, you're not a traditional brick and mortar retailer that's trying to adapt to online shopping. Um, it is easier to be adaptable, to have a digital first mindset. Um, for brands that aren't necessarily you know, digitally, digital first and they're catching up, um, you know, we, have a, we have a customer called Gil Marine. They're a, they're a British um, merchant and they sell apparel and related products into um, or I should say to boating uh, customers, right? So if I like to sail, if I have a power boat, um, I can buy products from them. Um, you know, they're a traditional retailer with um, really smart digital team, but they've had to get to that point. And so for them, they have had a fairly heavy infrastructure, ERP, point of sale systems that they needed to make work for their digital storefronts across multiple countries, right? And so, and they needed to make sure that, you know, customers can, can, can see prices, transact in prices, and the transaction would settle in, in, in certain ways that were conducive to those debt customers in Germany, in the US, in the UK. And so they, you know, one thing that's oftentimes overlooked that they executed on really, really well, and again, with the help of a really strong agency oftentimes, is making sure that the back office system is well integrated into um, whatever system you are going to use to be able to, you know, whether it's BigCommerce or anyone else, be able to, you know, present products and, and enable and facilitate transactions all the way through post sale, right? So you have to be thinking about integrating the right shipping solutions, the right ERP systems, the right point of sale systems. Um, and so the thing that's oftentimes overlooked is you just think about what's that front end experience going to be like for the customer. But, you know, that's kind of in many ways the tip of the iceberg. Underneath all of the water is all of the back office systems for a traditional retailer that they need to be thinking about um, for international expansion and making sure that those systems are as nimble as, you know, how, as they want to be from a front end standpoint for their customers. Mm -hmm. And for people who are, um, you know, when they're just entering into expanding into this and hearing all this information, I'm yep. sure there's plenty of people who are overwhelmed, but, you know, they know that why you all have attended this conference is a reason why you're looking to gather information, especially if you're at the beginning point, because you know that there's a lot of value to going mm -hmm. international. And for those who already are in that space, you know the challenges, but you know that there's ways to continue growing and that it's worth pursuing that different reasons today i'd love to hear from you from you what are some some of your advice when it comes to thinking about the you know the experience with going with your um you know planning to activate to make sure that you're um you know yeah you, know, you touched on back office you touched on different um you know nuances with um you know trends and things like that what are um you know what's a big overall thing that you want people to keep in mind when it comes to just taking this step to expand or to improve what they already have with international. Yeah. Experience. And it's, and it is a big part of why I like the test and learn approach. My answer to this is typically um, think and act locally, be genuine, right? It's, it's about international expansion and revenue generation for you as a merchant. Um, but if, if that's all you're thinking about, you know, consumers will see through that. Right. So you really do need to, if you're going to pick these three countries make most sense for me to start to expand into, be thoughtful about why those countries and what is it about the way, what, what consumers there care about that and it will enable you to be successful. So a really good example of this is we have an awesome, awesome customer in, in Skull Candy. And they're a traditional, they sell, you know, um, hardware, headphones and speakers and traditional retailer, right? Like, before selling online, most of their businesses, you know, you're flying and you're about to take off and your headset broke. You need to go into the store, you know, at the airport next to your gate. You can see Skull Candy headphones there, right? Or you go to Best Buy. Um, their direct-to-consumer approach internationally has been brilliant. So think of things like 
local collaboration with products that are already popular there, right? I'm going to give you really cool headphones um, with, uh, and by the way, this water bottle over here, I'm going to use the water bottle example, is really popular in Italy, right, or Canada. So I'm actually going to do a collab, a product mashup, a bundle with, with that brand and, and glom onto their cachet and figure out how the economics will work, right? Um, we have, we've seen them do awesome things like um, local charities. We're launching in Hong Kong, right? Here's a local charity that our customers in Hong Kong care about. Five, our, part of our launch, 10% of the proceeds are gonna go to this local charity that our customers have told us matters to them, right? Do something different, do something thoughtful, do something local that will matter to customers, may even get you free press in the local in the local publications and um, do it do it for the right reasons right um, because you think your products are fit and not just because it's a land grab so I would I would leave merchants with that thought I really love the phrase think and act locally I mean I literally wrote that down I I think that's such a great way to think about in terms of marketing especially with the way the market is going right now people are caring more about brands mm -hmm. beyond products and services. They really want things to be part of movements and things like that. And I love the examples you gave because it taps into what people care about as people and also just what their natural tendencies are, things that they just, you know, the way that they buy, the mm. things that they are already doing anyways before your product or service comes into their brain. So, um, and I think that Think and Act locally applies to all aspects, whether you are going international or you're looking to get hyper, hyper focused of, you know, what yeah. specific regions, cities, areas of the country you're already in. So yeah. I, I love that. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. Awesome. So thank you so much for sharing this with us, Stan. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to end up the day with us to kind of, you know, remind people like all the hard work that goes into and just give us more creative juices of how we can take the information we have and just apply with it and actually have fun with going international because it's, it's yeah. exciting and it's, you know, gives you and your team a new way to, you know, market and package your products and services in a different way than you would where you already have. So it just kind of keeps things going and keeps things interesting. Yeah. And it's a, it is a fun time to be selling online, right? We've obviously for a variety of reasons, this has been a catalysmic shift towards online spending. Um, you know, it's a challenge for many merchants to adapt to it. Um, so you know, don't be afraid to rely on experts to help you. I can, PDF the uh, um, kind of the checklist that I, I walked through today if it can be of any value to any of the, any of you listening out there too. That would be great. Thank you so much. And as Dan touched on, all of our speakers and experts are over in the expo area. All of their um, their companies are represented there, so that way you can get more information beyond what you got from here on these panels and sessions today. So. Mm -hmm. Head on over there if you want to continue those conversations, but also networking has begun because we want to create that in-person interaction that we're not able to have right now. So head over to the networking area so you can connect with each other, connect with speakers. And thank you again for being here, Dan. This has been a lot of value added for Charles's Going International event. So thank you again. My, my pleasure. It is uh, five o'clock somewhere. So let's head over to the networking <laughs> session. That sounds Cheers. good. All thank right, I'll see you, you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.